are tuned into a fireside chat with Zany Mystic. Join us now on another exciting metaphysical journey. Relax, tune in, drop out, and take a seat by the fire as we explore new realms and possibilities. This is Magenta Pixie. You can find me at magentapixie.weebly.com. But now, here is Zany Mystic and guest. Enjoy the show. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to a fireside chat with Zany Mystic. I'm your host, Lance White. Tonight, today, and tomorrow, and yesterday, my guest is Josephine Sellers. Josephine is a mother, grandmother, and a writer. She has had careers in the legal profession, art and craft movement, publishing, and is a transpersonal counselor specializing in equine assisted psychotherapy. Try saying that three times in a row. She runs a complementary therapy and teaching center in Dorset and lives in Somerset in the UK with her husband and extended family and animals. Josephine is also the author of a wonderful book called Parallel Worlds. <clears throat> in Parallel Worlds, Josephine demonstrates while living through the most difficult and painful of circumstances, the value in remaining steadfast to one's deepest soul connections. Throughout this engaging autobiographical account, Josephine stays true to herself and finds her trust is rewarded not in some distant heaven, but in the nitty-gritty of everyday life. You can find her work at www.josephinesellers.com, and her book is available at Amazon.com and in the UK at Amazon. So now let's welcome Josephine to the show. Hi, Josephine. How are you? Hi, Lance. I'm fine, and it's good to be talking to you. Oh, I'm so excited to be talking to you because I have to tell everybody listening and uh, whenever they hear this show is uh, I loved your book so much when I started reading it that I, uh, I bought a copy for my, for my best friend uh, out of town, and she loves it. I mean, it, 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 it's one of the most engaging and paradigm-shifting books that I have read in a long time, and it opens up so many doors and realms that, that we all have available to explore, and it's a wonderful book, and I just want to thank you for writing it and sharing your experiences. Uh, so there, I've said it. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure, Lance. I wrote the book, I hope, to inspire people so that it didn't matter how tough the going got that they kept going because that's all I had the choice to do and in the end it all comes beautiful in the end <laughs> yes yes well now you uh, were very sharp and very clever to document every step of your psychic journey with and your various journeys with precision so maybe you could share a little bit of background since the listeners don't really know what we're talking about when did this all begin well, I'd had an unusual childhood. I could see what I used to call a yesterday's person by my side. He was an old-fashioned clerical man. I'd been able to see healing energies, lights coming to me as a child because I'd been given absent, offered absent healing, and the lights used to frighten me as a child until I grew older and my parents explained what was going on. Um, so that's when it all started, but the big stuff started when I was about 19 years old. I started to get very powerful past life recall, and um, I went to live in an ancient thatch cottage in Dorset, and it was an old power site we found out many years down the line, site of an old stone circle, so there was a lot of psychic phenomena manifesting there, a lot of psychic communication, and I realized that things were so unusual, I needed to start logging, and that was about 40 years ago. So I, I just kept logging, really for the benefit, benefit of my family and extended family, to say, look, something's very unusual happening. I'm needing a normal life. I'm raising the children. I've got lots of animals. I'm running my own business. But there's another realm happening at the same time. So we were in parallel worlds then. Wow, wow. Uh, and and your journey gets more uh, gets increasingly more interesting as you start to connect to other psychics and your own psychic abilities. When did that begin? And uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about that. 
Well, the cleric who I'd seen in childhood eventually started to communicate when I was um, in that cottage in Dorset through a trance medium saying, you, you know, you've forgotten all about me, but I was there and, and you lost your connection in a way. I'd lost my connection because I really wanted to be the same as the other kids at school and everybody else. I, I felt a bit unusual and I had a lot of guilt around it, religious guilt, should I be doing this or not? Um, but eventually I did learn to communicate myself with this cleric and I went on to find he'd been my tutor. 400 years prior in Dorset, and he told me all about the site we were living on that went back to uh, the cottage site I was living on that went back to the year 3000 BC, setting up as stone circles. And he documented my life as one of 13 children on a big country estate in Dorset some 400 years prior as well, mm -hmm. uh, where I'd been one of 13 children. And my husband, who I'm married to now, had been my brother in those days. And we went on to find several family members back after 400 years, all living together in Dorset and all working in exploration of mm. possibilities. So that was uh, a really big synchronicity. I was very frightened to communicate with him in the, in the early days, but I learned to communicate through automatic writing, really. And he gave me a re-education. He really reminded me of all that I had forgotten, all the gifts that we all have, that in our culture and our upbringing in the Western culture in these days are not really enhanced in us, and it's very easy to lose connection. But I did make that connection, and what a wonderful experience that was. Like ecstasy and love being poured at me, and I was on my way from then onwards, and the world just opened up after that. The huh. universes woke, woke up after that for me. Wow. Uh, but it was a hard life. Yes. We had a lot of um, material struggle through recessions, a lot of trouble with the banking system, as everyone's having now. Yeah. It was a, uh, we were running our own business, and it was really a journey of growth through adversity and reaching to the other realms for help when the going got tough. Wow. Now, uh, you, uh, the psychic told you that you'd find a cottage with a certain view, and you'd recognize it if you saw that view. You did find that cottage and several more cottages after that. I kept <laughs> reading your book, and it was like, my God, how many times are they going to have to go through this? Yes. But that first cottage was such a thrill to read about. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? You ended up digging up the whole ground there, too, didn't you? <laughs> it was a beautiful cottage. We uh. were told about it um, uh, that we would find it. When I was told, I was in my mid-twenties, and I thought, oh, well, that's for much later on in life when we retire, but it obviously wasn't. Um, I saw a cottage. We wanted to move into the country. I saw the cottage advertised. I thought, I'm not going there. I don't want to buy what I've been told I'm going to have. I had a lot of resistance in the early days to being given predictions and following them through. I'd, I'd, something about me didn't like that, so I tried to resist, but hands grabbed me at the back really and said you will go and see that cottage and it was to the dot on the eye of the description i'd been given through a trance medium about four years prior uh -huh. and it was very beautiful but it had a strange energy it pulled us in our solar plexus when we left it we eventually had all this beautiful psychic communication first through the cleric who'd been my tutor 400 years ago and then many other entities coming back from the past who'd lived on the site, Roman soldiers, way, way back in time, telling us that we were on this ancient power site that used to be a stone circle. And I raised my family there, my children, for 16 years, and ran the cottage industry and, and had beautiful gardens and raised hundreds of pounds for charities by opening up those beautiful gardens. And everyone was drawn to the site. And so instead of having 40 or 50 visitors a weekend, we used to have two or 300 People were drawn to the site because the energy, it was an oasis in a, in a mad world, really, I suppose. And that was very beautiful there, but um, as you've read the book, as you know, uh, the wisdom of the planning and, and the, the governmental systems decided rather than having a beautiful thatched cottage there anymore, they'd like a housing estate, and we had to have our cottage demolished yeah. after 16 years and all this wonderful experience. It was so traumatic, as anyone listening would, could understand, what's it like to have 16 years of hard work, renovation, and oh, gardens, yeah. and psychic experience taken away from you, really. Yeah, yeah. But we, yeah. we came through it. I had communications with the other worlds. I had my cleric with me. He told me I was going on to another 
um, property in Dorset, a farm with lots of lovely land and rivers. So we moved on and we went with it. And that's how life has kept moving me on to really ancient properties and sites in Dorset and Somerset that had unrest or energetic problems that needed sorting out. And gradually over the years, I amassed colleagues and people who helped me understand what it was we needed to do and I needed to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, now, uh, the Reverend Thomas is quite eloquent and very profound, and thank goodness you documented, documented all of your conversations, and they're written in italics in your book. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at one now in Chapter 6, mm-hmm. and the, the wisdom and the depth of uh, it's insight and uh, beauty that he's expressing in his words to you are just beyond belief. And uh, that alone is worth reading your book. Uh, but to have that kind of, uh, that kind of guidance is really qu- uh, an amazing experience. And, uh, and as you say, this is something that is available to just about anybody that's open to suspending their belief systems and working with the the uh, spirits that are all around us. Yeah, it was. It is beautiful. He's quite poetic in the way he writes. Oh yeah. And um, I learned so much it, when I took those down all those years ago. I don't know, forty-five years ago, forty years ago. You know, I took them down, but it didn't mean that much to me. Um, I mean, I know they were beautiful and right. there, was, there was some huge wisdom, but you know, it wasn't until. Many, many years later, after I've had a lot of experience and adventures on all these sites, some of them pretty black and dark, that I went into transpersonal studies under a doctor of psychology and a shaman training to become a counselor and a psychotherapist. And it was as I understood psychology through the transpersonal realms of Carl Jung and Roberto Asagioli that I realized the wisdom I'd been given by this cleric all those years prior was so profound and when I went to write my dissertations I quoted him in them (laughs) Ah. and uh, that was that was just a magical experience I'd been given the information all those years prior and I brought it into my studies and my and and that enabled me to help my way through to get my qualifications to go out and work transpersonally with my clients Wow Wow you you have just had You've had a difficult but magical journey, and uh, <clears throat> the the way that you've been guided to these, I guess they would be called sacred sites. Now, are are those cottages that you've um, had? They've seems like they've been on powerpoints. That there are certain areas on the earth that are uh, either sacred or they're around ley lines. And uh, they seem to draw a certain or kind of uh, energy uh, to them. And, of course, your job has been par- in part to go to those places, like you said, and release the spirits that are there and the energies and then move on. Uh, what are some of the experiences that you had subsequent to your, your first cottage? Well, the cottage site was actually a beautiful site. Being a, a stone circuit, it was a, a profound energy site. Um, because of the energy, I think it allowed us to see through the layers, the layers of the ether, and to perceive other worlds. Um, my children. Hello. Hello, hello. Really, the rest of the sites tended oh. to be. Okay. <laughs> the rest of the sites tended to be of a much darker nature that needed cleansing. Ah. Ah, and um, now the, some of the sites that you, you've moved to have been darker sites, as you said. Uh, what, how did you communicate with the spirits of those places? Well, that was, going on the darker sites was a, a very traumatic and a very difficult circumstance to go through. Um, but had I had not had the initiation with William Thomas and the understanding, I don't think I would have survived them. Or maybe I wouldn't even have seen them. I don't know. But I went to an ancient Somerset farmhouse that eventually we came to understand had been the site of a Civil War massacre. And we lived there for 18 months. Um, 
when we went to see the farmhouse, it was all beautifully redecorated, all magnolia throughout, wonderful views set on a Somerset hill. But on the second day, I stood on the second landing, and I just felt myself as a Puritan, young Puritan lady, really thin, and I, re and I, was, um, I had angst in me, and I really didn't want to be there. And what happened on that site was it continually manifested its distress. Oh. Um, it was haunted, you could say. There were hammerings on the door, footsteps on the staircases. The whole family, again, we were living with the extended family because we run family businesses, and it was a good site to run the business from. But it was hell to be in, and it oh. caused a lot of disturbance among the family as well as we came to terms with it and went out and sought help. And eventually, uh, the biggest transformation on that site of that Somerset farmhouse happened on the day of the funeral of Princess Diana. Oh, my goodness. Uh, where we sat down to watch the... Just my husband and I were at the farm that day, and we sat down to watch it, and suddenly by the window by the front door, I saw this huge... Well, I didn't realize he was a cavalier with a big black hat, but I knew I didn't want to look in his eyes. And eventually... Uh, I saw all the plaster peel off the farmhouse and uh, walls, and I was back to the stone, and I saw all the soldiers down on the ground with muskets pointed, and I realized there was something pretty horrific going on. And I heard the hammering on the door, which we'd heard all the years we'd been there, all the weeks we'd been there, because we were only there for 18 months. And I looked into the eyes of this great big cavalier with his great white plume, and he handed this piece of paper to me, and what followed was a massacre for... Uh, hiding a uh, rogue preacher, really. And I just got down and did the work. I'd watched psychic rescue mediums work over the years, and I just did all that I'd watched others do to bring peace and to forgiveness and to elevate those spirits from that site that were causing such trouble still. They got stuck in their trauma. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a big one. And not long after I'd left the site and moved away, an old psychic came to my house who I hadn't seen for years, and he drew, he said, I've got a, you've got a beautiful cavalier by your side, I'm going to draw him, and this is what he wants to say to you. And he came back to me and thanked me for sending him on his way. M amazing evidence for me, because that's what I need, evidence to come back to prove that, you know, it's not a figment of my imagination. Absolutely, and you have beautiful drawings inside the book, too, which are, are quite charming. I mean, the whole book is just a, a wonderful, magical ride. Um, you mentioned Diana, and I, I just want to kind of take a moment here while we're, uh, while we're chatting to ask if you sensed anything about Diana or her death at the time that that happened. I think that the trauma that ran through the nation, uh, she was obviously very beloved by everybody. And I just felt that the, the um, outpouring of emotion on that day was so huge, it almost affected the energy of a, well, certainly here in the UK, it was a surreal day. And I think because of that, it, it must have allowed the site that I lived on to manifest itself for healing. I can, it, I, that's all I can uh, assume. Wow. Um, she, she was unusual. <laughs> yes. And yes. she's left her mark. And oh, she's absolutely. still remembered she's, very she's, fondly by us all. She's much loved, isn't she? Yeah. And her her children go on, and they're the, they're, there's a lot of her in them. Good, good. <laughs> now, <laughs> that's very good. Um, now, uh, over the years and, and uh, these various cottages that you were drawn to, you also found some incredible connections to the uh, divas, elementals, I guess you could call them, or the, the spirits of the uh, animals. And you found that horses are quite special. Um, and you got into communicating with the horses. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Well, I will, yes. I kept, I've had horses ever since I lived in that cottage. So I've had horses for about 40, 45 years. And always loved them. They'd always been... I'd always had very relaxed and happy horses. I was, a, I was lucky in those days. They were beautiful and they were a part of our family. And so my love of horses was huge. When I uh, trained in to become a transpersonal counselor and psychotherapist, I, I, I was introduced by reading a book, actually, from the USA, oh. uh, The Tao of Equus by Linda Cornerhoff. 
And at the time, I was quite poorly. I had leg trouble, and I just um, acquired a very young and damaged piebald horse. And when I read this book, I was consumed with emotion because I could see what she was writing about, the beauty of horses, their ability to communicate and mirror us. And here was I, not well at the time, and I had a thick horse, and we were, we were mirroring each other. And I thought, oh, there's something so magical. I've always loved horses. And I'm trained in transpersonal psychology. I work in psychosynthesis, and we use creative applications, be it drama therapy, music therapy, journaling. And I realized that I could use my horses to work alongside me. And uh, I went out on the Internet to research, and I realized I could come out to the USA and spend 10,000 pounds and get trained, but I didn't have the money. <laughs> and a colleague of mine said, well, she worked in the addictions field, and she said, well, we're all going to train down in Gloucester in the UK, and the, the trainers are coming over from the USA, and you can come and train with us. And I got trained up in equine-assisted psychotherapy, and it was, I then went on to fuse it into a very transpersonal, psycho-spiritual mode of working with my horses, and I invited them to be my co-therapists, and they work alongside me. I now have four horses I work with, and they've done a lot of good work with children and families and with adults, and what can I say about horses? They are able to intuit what's going on for us, behind the mask that we often put up as a front to survive in life. Ah. They see into our, our beauty and our soul, and they also see our pain. And when, they, when we're owning our pain, they come in and offer us support, and that's huge when, when a, a, an animal sees your pain and can hold it. It's, it's like um, a soul-to-soul -soul moment. They see the beauty in you, and, and my clients see the beauty, the soul, the the magnificent connection in the horse, and, and it sort of fires that forgotten spark that we've all got within us. Wow, that's wonderful. Um, you, where I live in the country, there is a neighboring pasture that has uh, several horses there, and yes. when I walk my dog, I make it a point of trying to go up to the fence and, and pull some of the green grass from, the, from this side of the fence to feed them <laughs> because they eat it down to the nub. And they're vegetarians, of course, uh, which I find very interesting. Uh, mm. They don't eat meat, and yet look at how strong they are. And uh, so I've started talking to them and trying to communicate, and I think I'm, I'm being successful. I'm being as authentic as I can be, and they're just so uh, peaceful and so uh, loving, uh, mm. you know, as is all nature. Um, yes. So uh, I, I think we're really in for some lessons here during this time. Yeah, I do feel that it is. It's probably only going to be by turning our our way back to the natural world. To, yes. We were once natural ourselves, but we've become so commercialized and so changed to the original concept that we sort of have lost our way somewhat. And I think, for, well, for me, certainly horses help to show me the way back. Any animal helps to show me the way back. But the natural world to get out in the wilderness, the environment, the woods, look at the sky at night, it just reminds you that you're a part of something far more than the little boxes we live in and the shell of our body. Whoa, absolutely, absolutely. Now, during your uh, various communications with the Reverend and with others who followed, and in your work with the, ther with the therapy that you do, have you learned anything that uh, would point to these times that we're in now as being a significant uh, transformational point or turning point for humanity? Yes, I have. I mean, when I first communicated with the Reverend William Thomas, one of his first writings 20, 30, whatever years ago it was, saying, told us that we were going to go into such amazing times that we'll... He said, well, it will excite you beyond all belief. And, and I didn't realize he was meant all those years on, up now, 2012. Yeah. But, yes, for sure, we, I, it's as though everything is accelerating. And, and the, the information that comes to me is that we need to remember who we really are. We need to work on our psychology. We need to get out of all these false senses of self, these defense mechanisms, to get authentic and to get real and to get communicating back from the other worlds to this world because we're part of the other worlds. We've come down here at this time to, to help this process of evolution, really, for humanity. 
and this planet. Mm -hmm. So I think we're living in their exciting times, their traumatic times, obviously, because mm -hmm. you've got the light and the dark all showing itself up at once in this great swirl of, of energy and ongoing emotion. But I feel that culturally and worldwide media-wise, we're only reflected the darker stuff back. And it's, it's up to us to, to try and remember the, the, the brighter and the lighter and push through all that repression that seems to come down on us and take our courage. And in, they, it tries to imbue us with fear. And we've got to move beyond the fear and realize that we are actual, as individuals, extremely potent and powerful things. And if we can line ourselves up and, and get our thought processes projecting out to better things, that's an energy in itself that brings the light towards us. So it, it's, it's, it's something that each and every one of us can do. We're all a part of it. Mm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, uh, one of the things that I, I see uh, happening is that uh, uh, the controlled media ha it seems to have a grip on the masses so many people are just hypnotized into believing various things that are not true uh, through religions and uh, the media politics and uh, so on and so forth and it seems that the all we can do is is uh, work on ourselves individually and then come together uh, as uh, spirits and uh, beings of like mind and hope that the and intend that this uh, this grip that uh, the illusion has on people is loosened somewhat so that we actually can recognize our sovereign ability and our connection to light and to the higher higher realms. Um, do you see that happening there yes, uh, I where do. you are? Absolutely, and, and this is why we're talking across the uh, Atlantic yes. today, isn't it, Aunt Lois? Yes, you, know, you know that. I yes. know that here, and there are countless others around the world that know it, and we, yes. we need to keep communicating through the magic of the web and the Internet. I suppose that is giving us an ability to reach out much further and to touch, touch all those souls. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to find a way to try and help our fellow man to just maybe not try to pay so much attention to all the drab media stuff that comes towards us and to, and to, to find themselves again. Yes. And we've got amnesia, and the media gives us amnesia, and it, it continually feeds us and keeps us shut down, and we just need to wake up. And uh, yes. ever since I was young, in my 20s, I've always had this desire to stand up on the cash out in the, in the supermarkets and the malls and say to everyone, wake up. I've, I've always had this feeling. Uh, you know, don't give up. You know, you see all this angst amongst couples, old couples bickering, mothers shouting at their children. And you think, oh, for God's sake, there's hope out there. You know, you can get beyond all these patterns of behavior. Yeah. You, can, you can find who you really want, why you're together this time. Maybe you've come back to learn something. So yeah. let's stop fighting and let's understand why we're together and what we've done in the past that maybe we're trying to resolve. It's a complex hologram we're living in. Uh, but yes. um, we're just not given. We're just fed um, restricted dogma through religion. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and, and it does seem that those, uh, those control structures will have to be broken down for people to uh, be able to think for themselves and make their own connections to their higher source and higher self. Uh, one of the people I admire a lot who seems to be doing tireless work in this direction is uh, from your country, uh, David Icke. Oh, yes. I do know him <laughs> quite <Yeah>. well. <laughs> <laughs> he's a wonderful soul. I've read most of his books, and uh, uh, he's just marvelous. Well, many, 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 many years ago, when I wrote my first book, The Return, I did write the story to do with the cottage originally in its entirety, just there, because I thought that's the end. Nothing else will happen. <laughs> that was amazing. I was very um, inhibited in those days and didn't like to speak much. Uh -huh. And my researcher used to speak for me. And we went to the ballroom of a grand country house one day, and my researcher told my story. And I hid at the back of the ballroom, pretending uh, I wasn't there. And in the front row of the audience that night was David Icke. And he, hadn't, he was still in TV as a uh, sports reporter in those days. 
Uh-huh. And at the end, my researcher invited me to come up from the back and say, well, this is Josephine. She hadn't got the courage to tell her story then. And David uh-huh. Icke came up to me and he said, oh, I'm so fascinated in what you're about because I am beginning to have strange things in my life. And ever since then, you know, that's how I got to know him. <laughs> and I wrote another book a few years later, and he wrote all down the back of it for me. So oh. I do know David. <laughs> oh, how nice. He's a, he's a, he's a system buster. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I love systems busters. And uh, years ago, <laughs> I read... He's more courageous a... than me. <laughs> oh, well, yes, I don't want to be up on a stage, but we're we're doing our part for to bust systems where we are, sitting in our chairs talking on these <laughs> electronic... Uh, in cans, you know. Yeah, uh, we put our heads over the parapet. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. Um, you know, uh, he's indirectly connected with the Montague, Montague Keene Foundation, which I have a great amount of respect and admiration for as well. Okay. Okay. They do quite a bit of psychical research, yeah. and uh, that's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful source of information as well. And uh, we have a mutual friend through Barbara Han Clow, whose work I admire greatly. Ah. So all of these things, you know, intertwine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at some point, these uh, inter- interconnecting uh, light grids are starting yeah. to make themselves known. And, uh, I, you know, it's becoming a smaller world here on the planet. <laughs> I think so, too. And I think we see the systems crumbling out there. Well, we certainly see them around the world. You know, we see corruption being uncovered, and and suddenly people are are, are becoming quite cynical. I think people hear the news and they think, oh, yes, tell me another one, you know. (laughs) I think we're becoming cynical about what we're being given, and that that disempowers it, doesn't it? Once you start laughing at the trash you're being fed, it loses its power. Right. I, and once you don't buy into the fear and you realize that most of the things that make us afraid are simply uh, 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 events that have been uh, created by various elements within our own governments and yeah. in connection with other governments that are just trying to give us a good scare. So I don't <laughs> I buy anything anymore. I agree with you absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even d- down to the weather events that uh, cause tsunamis and uh, nuclear holocausts and, and oil spills and the rest of it, these things are all contrived by various black uh, groups' operations. And, you know, they have a hand in, the, in all of it. And if you keep tracing the threads back, you can, they all seem to point in the same direction. So uh, the best thing, as I can see, to do is to laugh at it and just recognize that I'm not buying into it. I'm not going to be a frightened because that is an energy that is used to, that's fed off of, just as the energy of worship uh, is fed off of. We're used, We're like uh, we're like filet mignon for those who uh, tap into this energy that we give them, and we're so predictable that uh, you know the press a button here and oh we got a good one. We got uh, 60 million people are terrified now. Oh, let's, let's, let's have lunch. That's a d- delicious lunch for us today. <laughs> I would absolutely agree with you, Lance. And <laughs> the reason I put my book out was that when, I, when you talk to some parts of the population, as, as you're talking now, they mm. actually shut down and can't cope with it. Yes. And I decided that I would write my book and keep it on a certain level yes. of, um, so that there was actually no mention of, of those levels of, of what's going on in it. Exactly. Because I, I wanted to get people courageous in their own space that they could then look at those possibly darker things that they've got to work, work their way through. Yes, yes. And I wrote my book with the same intent, and I, did, I just barely brushed upon it. I don't go into yeah. any details about it whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll send you a copy of my book. I can't wait to read it. Yes, you just send me your address, and I'll give you. I'll send a signed copy out to you. I look uh, forward to it, that. It's a wild ride, let me tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like wild rides, and it's nice to share our experiences. Well, that's what it is. And, you know, I think what we're doing is we are setting uh, yeah, we're an example for others who have had these experiences so that we all get to realize, one, we're not unique, two, we're not alone. And those, uh, uh, those experiences that so many people have had that are psychic or empathic or 
you know, uh, even E.T. Uh, yeah. related are real. Yes. They're more yeah, real but... than the illusion that we're buying into here that's not pleasant. So uh, if I have a choice, I would prefer to uh, communicate with these wonderful beings who are so clever and intelligent and fun and wise, uh, whether they're from this planet or not. Well, uh, absolutely, and as you know, you read the end of the end parts of my book, and oh, yeah. you know, my husband wouldn't have been alive today with our extraterrestrial extraterrestrial intervention. Oh yes, tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, you know, he he poisoned himself in a in an industrial accident, and he was mm-hmm. so ill. Um, he developed what the uh, medical profession said was rampant cancer, and he had only a a few weeks left to live, and uh, we called for extraterrestrial intervention, and uh, well, he got better again against all the odds, and uh, it all went down on his medical records, but um, I was told, we were told, he will be rebuilt, because you need him uh, to be able to go out and write your book and tell your story. You still need <laughs> him, and he can't die. It's not, he can't, he can't go now. This accident can't have caused his death, so it, it was reversed. Wow. So we moved through a shift. He moved through a parallel. He took a lot of psychological healing at the time as well, but he's a fit and healthy man, and he's broken all the medical records, and he's by my side as uh, I write my book and travel out there. So that's at the end of the book. And uh, also, you know, I went on to find the, the cleric, the, uh, the, a reincarnated part of the cleric oh, yeah. 400 years ago came back and found me. Yes, yes. Uh, how is that going today? Well, wow, it's amazing. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> he, he, uh, to, to be uh, able to write, talk to him. You can yeah. see the way he writes, poetic at the end oh, of the book. Oh, yes. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. And for him to recognize who he is uh, yes. in that incarnation, and you're both alive today, what I an know. amazing experience Oh, that, that was is. the icing on the cake, really, for me. It's just like a fairy story. Yes. I just said, where are you? And within weeks, he found us. <laughs> you know, I just say, out on the ether, there must be a part of you that's come back, just as there's a part of me that's come back. Yes. I'm sure you're out there somewhere, and what happened? He'd reincarnated back onto the same estate. Right, <laughs> right, uh, right. But the way I found him was mysterious. He came in search of an engine for a big vehicle. Yes, yes. Things are not always as they seem, are they? No. <laughs> it's the synchronicities of life that are beyond belief, that are yes. the sheer magical sparks that make you think, well, life is worthwhile after all. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, I'm finding that the synchronicity, the more I'm in tune with my own uh, self and strip away the, the, that which is inauthentic, uh, the more I realize that the synchronicities of, of my own life in each moment are teaching me what I need to know in the moment. Yes. And then things just show up, and uh, there, yes, there are more difficult moments, and there are down times, and with these solar flares and the rest, I've had a lot of uh, uh, sleeping time because I have to integrate the energies. Yeah. But, uh, you know, then there are the magical moments that just cannot be ignored, and who would want to ignore them when you're experiencing the, the beauty of the pinnacles of life? Yes. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's like fireworks going off. Every now and then there's like a giant Roman candle and you think, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. we're on our way home to, who yes. we really, to be who we were really meant to be. Yes, yes. And I'm willing to, to stay long enough to find out what that uh, journey, where the journey will take me. Uh, mm-hmm. I've lost a lot of my resistance to not wanting to be here. Uh, it's very difficult to be here right now. This is not an easy time, uh, but fortunately, uh, people such as yourself have done the, the horrendous task of cultivating not only your own inner life and your spiritual connection to all that is, to spirits that are here and to the ETs and to, the, the, to Gaia, the elementals and the fairies. I'm sure you could tell stories for days about the spirits of the flowers, <laughs> And, well, I've worked with flowers for years. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. if anybody knows it, about them, you would. <laughs> well, 
Well, nature is profound. There's so, there are so many energetic levels of communication we can tune into. One of the greatest things I tune in, I picked up in one of the properties I went to live on a side of a Celtic hill fort for about another couple of years and picked up a herd of, of, of Celtic, a etheric herd of Celtic horses who are, are invited to the valley I live now, and they've worked with me with the horses in therapy with people, and they've helped me work on it. The site I live on now is the site of a huge um, medieval settlement and way beyond there where there's been a lot of angst and a lot of unrest and a lot of battle and a lot of blood and loss of life, and, and I've worked shamanically in more mm-hmm. recent years with that etheric herd of Celtic horses to help move those that have got stuck in that time warp of centuries past to move on and off of this planet, off to where they need to go. Mm. So mm. using the uh, the power and the energy of horses in a herd from Celtic times has been huge. But they're wow. by my side, and it empowers you. When you feel them around you, you go with them, and it's this great wave of positive healing energy that they offer and, and uh, that you can tune into. And without them, you know, I'd feel quite inept, I think. Oh, yes, yes. And um, it, it seems to be leading us in a direction where the past is being resolved and released, and we're moving into some new, new, uh, new world, new world that uh, maybe we've never experienced before, all of us. Well, yeah, absolutely. It's as though we're letting go of all our ancestral stuff. Yes. Um, yes. Resolving it so we don't continually keep, because I don't think we can keep coming back in that old mode because the planet wouldn't be left uh, here if we do that. That's right. You know, we've got to change. That's right. And uh, so our old patterns have got to stop, and it stops with this generation, I think, and all yes. the little children that are coming in are so magical and special today. They're the ones who've brought the memory and the possibility that we can stop the rot now and move forward into this new place that we haven't been before. Yes. Now, you talked about the corruption and greed and the rest, and you've had so many dealings with the heartless quality of the banks, uh, and, uh, and we know that the corporations are, the corporations and the, uh, the banks and the rest of it are all intertwined in, in a control paradigm. Mm-hmm. But uh, do you see that as uh, shifting uh, substantially during this particular period of time as we move into heart-centered and spirit-based realities? Well, for, for sure, it's got to change. I mean, at, at least when I fought the banks, which was about 20 years ago, um, no one will believe me when I uncovered what was going on. We, we uncovered such corruption. I was referred to as a loose cannon. And I heard so many terrible stories in those days of what was happening to people who dared to be a loose cannon. Horrible yeah. stories. Yeah. Enough to, you know frighten the living daylights out of you and um, things i said to people they they wouldn't believe me but now look you, you people reading it today would say well yes <laughs> we know it goes on now so uh, once we get awareness of something we get power over it but we're, we're aware of corruption now aren't we it's not just the one odd person on their own we all know it it, it stinks out there basically <laughs> and, <laughs> and 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 um, for that simple reason, it'll lo- it will begin to lose its grip. I feel sure it will. Yes, yes. It has to. It, ha- it yes, really there has is no, to. Yes, there is no choice. That there is no for choice. Us, uh, if, if for those who choose to remain in a control paradigm that uh, is in duality, and that includes the horrors of wars and the rest of it, well... Uh, I can't speak for anybody else, but I choose to be in a reality that doesn't contain those negative uh, forces. Yeah. So it, it seems to be a matter of those of us who choose not to participate in uh, anything that is of a lower vibration, and that frees us up to be creative and to expo- explore and express ourselves in ways that maybe we've never done before. Uh, I'm 61, and I just feel like I'm, start- I'm being reborn. Well, I think that's what happens. I think once you do, it's as though you l- take your roots. I feel like I've had my roots taken out the ground and, and that um, they've been put into not a flower pot, but they've just got a bag around them. And that sort of frees you up, that you can sort of come up out of it. And, 
and and just not give your thoughts to all that dross and power. Right. Just just not give it power because it's like a virus when it gets hold of you. Oh yeah. And you've got to you've got to elevate it above it above it, and and it's up. It's going to be people's choice whether they want to get their root loose. And, yeah. and come up through that veil and, and move, shift up a parallel or not. Yes. It's about personal choice, but it would be very nice if things that you write about and I write about encourage lots more people to loosen their roots in the old ways. <laughs> yep, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Loosen their roots and let their hair down. <laughs> 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 or up, whatever, you know. Just, yeah, that, uh, so we're prop. sort of in transition. We're in transit. We've loosened, our, we've loosened our roots into those old paradigms and, and, and systems. We, yeah. we've, we've, come up, we've, we've seen through them. We've seen how wrong they are, how controlling they are, how dark yeah. and how fearful they are. And, you know, I've lived my life with my husband on the edge of a knife for 40-odd years, 45-odd years, um, it's scary at times because you lose, you know, we've lost everything in recessions, we've been penniless, homeless, but we've survived together, we've kept the animals, and, and I've always known, something's always told me, it didn't matter how back it got, I would always be okay, and, and that's what we hopefully can all remember, that we will be okay if we prepared to take the risk to move on. And it's hard to take risks, but it is only when you take the risk that the, Absolutely. a light and opening comes, really, I think. Absolutely. And uh, one of the things that I, I get from your book and from uh, just uh, so much around me is that the fear of death needs to be brought up and looked at and released. Uh, oh, once yeah. you Once you understand, as you do, from, from talking to the other side, that there is no death, that mm-hmm. we're, we are a continuum of spirit and that we're far more vast than we can possibly know in these limited bodies, this bio mm-hmm. body bag, uh, mm-hmm. that once we realize that we're eternal and infinite, that there is no death, then it removes the fear of all of these earth changes that seem to be popping up in the perceptual screen of so many people. You know, uh, mm-hmm. for instance, a lot of people are, uh, are uh, talking about the planetary alignments and there's going to be a huge earthquake and it's the end of the world and blah 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 mm. well mm. we're still here aren't we <laughs> yeah i see it uh, i see that purely as a metaphorical yes um yes. scenario it's it's yes. not the actuality it's how it's been perceived our interpretation is uh off key at times yes well it, it i almost i see everything as a metaphor Including yeah. myself, I am a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. what is some of the, what was one of the most profound uh, things that you uh, would like to share with us about your experiences uh, over these many decades? Well, I think I'd like to go back to the point that you have just mentioned uh, yourself um, about knowing you you don't die. For me. Um, As a young child, I was, my parents were interested in healing, and uh, they were also what you would term old-fashioned spiritualists, so they knew that there were spirits, and I suppose I was in that respect lucky in childhood that that was nurtured. I knew that although my grandmother had died, she hadn't gone completely, so I suppose if you have good, sort of good belief systems put in in the early days and your parents mirror a truth back to you i i was helped in that respect and that was lucky it allowed me to keep that connection alive and i had met a lot of very gifted psychics over the years who continually brought me evidence from the other worlds to people i'd lost who you know they no one else other than those people could have known and, and my own father who's been gone for some 20 years he's continually communicating back now helping me guiding me, advising me, showing me where the opportunities are coming, encouraging me continually. And, and, and it is that wonderful connection to those that have, we know have loved us dearly that aren't that far away, that they are just up a few parallels and they can, they've got an, an oversight and they can feed that oversight back in and help us. So for me, the most profound thing is the communication with the spirits, with the ancestors, and with the very evolved spirits that are out there as well, 
who are trying desperately to get through and help us, but they cannot invade us. And we have to have the courage to say, I want help and seek them. And I say to anyone, you know, when you're in real trouble, just before you go to sleep at night, just say, I need help, I need guidance. And as we go into sleep and we lift out of our powerful conscious mind into the subconscious and the superconscious, we can make connection. And we might wake up the next day and not remember much about it, but we will feel that our energy and our spirit has been lifted and we may just have a few more degrees of courage that day to move forward. So for me, the most profound thing is the ability to know, absolutely know without doubt, that you and I and we are not alone. Mm. Mm. Well, that is so beautifully said. I, I, I hope that people... Uh, when this uh, record hits the recording, that people play that part back because it's just priceless information, and it's true, and that is what we need to focus on is our own inner truth, and it's so interesting that that uh, when we come to this for ourselves, we see that our inner truth overlays or maps over others' inner truth, and you can't deny it. You just know certain things. It's an inner knowing. You don't have to go to the Encyclopedia Britannica or some ancient scripts or Gnostic Gospels to find out what's true because you have access within yourself to all knowledge and all wisdom at all times. There's yeah. nothing missing. We have everything in us. Absolutely, and we love. Can tap That's into just that. so true. Yeah. Um, but it sometimes takes a lifetime to get to <laughs> that state of knowing, and I was known as Doubting Thomas but I have, anyone who reads my book will see how I've tested it continually. Tested it, doubted it, tested it. And I said, well, if you want me to believe that, you're going to have to prove it. So someone will come to me from 50 miles away and come in the room and say, hey, did you know this? And I say, yeah, I knew it yesterday. <laughs> but I have to have evidence to give me the courage to keep on going. And it's, it's very hard for people in the early days to get that knowing but I say don't ever give up keep reading keep learning keep listening to the radio go out and look for all the alternative alternative stuff and wait until you get that little resonance within you and you it says well that seems a lot more closer to the truth than I was ever taught since I was a child both academically culturally and religiously so I'm going to go with what feels right instead of what I've been told I know oh, yeah. I, I read things that resonate inside me then that's the truth for me yeah, yeah. Oh, again, beautifully said. We're just, you are just such a wonderful guide and teacher for all of us. And and I and I can't say enough how much I love your book and how you document things. So even the most skeptical people, because you were skeptical, and Huge. you have documented it to a T. So um, it, it, we just we all get to go on this journey with you in your book, Parallel Worlds. Uh, which is just an amazing read, and it's a paradigm-shifting book because you take us, you actually shift our consciousness in, in the reading of the book, and that's something that is quite an accomplishment. Well, thank you, Lance. I, um, that's really beautiful of you to say that, but let me just say to everybody, when I speak, it's not just me that speak. It's not Josephine in this world today. When I go on the phone and I speak, I close my eyes and I trust they'll give me the words that will inspire because when we go through this level and move up, I hope to, that I open the floodgates and take thousands with me. And that was the aim of writing that book. Wow. Well, we're almost to the end of the hour, and um, there's just enough time for you to tell us about what you're up to today, just uh, briefly, and to share your websites with us and let people know how they can find you and how they can find your book. Well, as you've mentioned, I've got my own personal website, josephinesellers.com. Since Christmas, some colleagues of mine who work in media invited me to front a TV channel called the Awakening TV Channel. And if you go on my website and push the button, you'll go through to the Awakening TV Channel. And I'm bringing on all my friends and colleagues who've helped me over the years to be filmed and interviewed and share of their wisdom. And one of the first people I've brought on is a, a psychic medium called Janine Glynn, and Janine Glynn is a survival medium. She categorically is able to bring 
yesterday's people, your dead relatives, back to you who will tell you they still have conscious awareness and are there. And wow. that's how the program started. And then I've gone right through. I've got lots of great people working in therapy, um, psychology, or people who work in earth energies. And I'm going to bring them onto that channel, one new one every week. So there's wow. lots of magical stuff to watch out there. Wow, that is fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm being inspired also to work on my own website. I, in the six years that I've been doing this show, I have not had a website. I have a very low profile, and I'm being drawn into doing certain things here with my property and with a healing center. And um, I will have a link, uh, a list of links that I uh, find helpful, and you will definitely be on my list of links. And that creates a, a, a web of light for all of us so that when we trust somebody and we like their information, we can just see, well, who do they like? And check out all the different things. And your show sounds fantastic. Well, that's the way to do it, Relance, isn't it? We all link up and they bounce off of your site onto mine and onto countless others. And so we actually radiate all that knowledge out there so it becomes so available. And people won't want to watch their TVs any longer, will they? That's they want to right. go out on the Internet and see what the others are talking about. Oh, yes. Well, the television is boring. My goodness. I... <laughs> it is compared to this, isn't it? It is. This is, a, <laughs> this is really exciting stuff. And to, to know that there are so many people that are sharing uh, this higher information in their own ways, and, and you, you can just go in so many directions and find it. Yeah, well, there's a certain amount of freedom, I suppose, today. At least we don't have our heads cut off for doing such things. We can't be burnt at the stake as heretics anymore. So we're well, above the parapet and quite safe to do it, and uh, it's yes, exciting. It, yes, it is. It's, it's a little safer today. So, uh, you know, uh, they only kill scientists that uh, are t telling too much. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that this too shall pass, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Josephine, thank you so much for being on this show. Uh, this has been one of the most wonderful chats that I've had in a long time. And, of course, I, I love all my guests. I fall in love with each one. But you, you are especially uh, have a place in my heart. And I can't recognize, recognize, I can't recognize myself in the mirror. I can't recommend your book enough, Parallel Worlds. I would thank you, Lance. It's beautiful to speak to you, to have connected to you over the Internet in the last few weeks. And I want a copy of your book, Lance. You just send me your address and I'll get one out this week. I will. And I Who have knows? a friend you in may the UK, one day. Magenta Pixie, is out there somewhere. And uh, she's a dear friend, too. She channels a group called The Nine. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'll say hello to her at the moment, too. So. Josephine, oh, well, I look wonderful. forward to Maybe your we'll all meet show. one day, Lance. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Josephine. Thank you, Lance. Thank you for the interview. It was wonderful. Oh, it, it was wonderful. We'll stay in touch. Yeah, we will. All Bye, right. Lance. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.